Welcome to the Radical CEO, transformation stories from the C-suite with your host, Libby Gill. Libby started her career in Hollywood where she led communications at media giants, Sony, Universal, and Turner Broadcasting. Now, as a human engineering expert, she leads leadership, coaching, and consulting firm, Libby Gill & Company, where she guides Fortune 500 clients to lead through change, challenge, and chaos. An international speaker and award-winning author, Libby's mission with this videocast is to bring you intimate conversations with business and thought leaders who've transformed careers and companies with their radical ideas and bold actions. Welcome, everybody, to The Radical CEO. I'm glad you're here today because we've got a a, a different kind of a guest who he's taken more U-turns and variations in his career, I think, than even I have, and I've done a lot of that. Shane Keough is with us today, and Shane is an ex-athlete turned CEO of a company called We Go For Two. He'll explain what that company name means in just a second, but that is a B Corp. And if you don't know what a B Corporation is, it's a really interesting kind of endeavor. They have to be certified as a B Corp. And in order to do that, you've got to demonstrate a balance between purpose and profit. Uh, And you've got to meet legal and certification requirements that say that you are meeting certain standards. But that's not where he started. He started, well, all the way back, his family business, the, the, the family operation was baseball. Shane's grandfather was a scout for the St. Louis Cardinals. His dad was a pitcher for the Oakland A's, California team, and also for Japan's Hansen Tigers. And Shane himself was a baseball player. But as often or sometimes happens, uh, life intervenes and takes you in a completely different direction, which led Shane with a few twists and turns to the sustainability business that he runs today. So welcome, Shane Keo. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Libby. I appreciate it. Excited to be here with you today. Well, first explain, I, I, I have to say I have limited knowledge of sports, like baseball, especially from the stands, sitting there with a hot dog and a beer. But what does we go for two mean? And why does it apply to this sustainability business? Yeah, well, you know, We Go For Two was kind of my nod to my past in sports, but also kind of to the future of the health of our planet and the the two degrees uh, climate change number that we really want to focus on. So within sports, going for two is going that little bit extra, uh, putting in a little bit more. You know, you got to do one more set, a little bit extra to try to push the envelope, where in sustainability and environmental work, uh, that two degrees Celsius is really important. So I really believe that uh, this kind of united front uh, where everybody's involved because you know sustainability uh, doesn't see color, it doesn't see uh, how much money you make, it just sees that you're a living being and it wants to help make a difference. So uh, we're excited to be here. So we go for two, two being the, the two degrees is how mm-hmm. we can stem, I don't know if we stop climate change, but it's where we can start to bring it back in, right? Yes, you know, that's kind of just the number that scientists kind of universally from around the world have agreed upon. You know, this is kind of the threshold we want to stay with under, or at least that's our focus, you know, whether the planet cooperates, because, you know, it is uh, its own little living organism. So, you know, what's good for the planet isn't always good for us as a human being species. But, um, you know, we try to just make things better for ourselves. And we realize the planet uh, will take care of itself as well. Yeah, and, and people just don't like inconvenience, do they? No, no. And, you know, polarization of topics and, uh, you know, but political things, you know, that kind of really can get in the way of sustainability where, you know, right now we've realized simply it's about cutting costs, making new money, you know, turning revenue out of, uh, you know, costs right now, which is really where sustainability is going. Um, and then just social impact and involvement is kind of how communities get involved on the the local scale. Well, I want to ask you about the sustainability world, but before we get to that, I want to backtrack a little bit and tell me about your baseball career. Okay. And then, and where that went and set you on a new path. Yeah. So, you know, obviously you, you alluded to my, my family, uh, I think combined, you know, I played about four years. So uh, you add that to the about 86 years combined for the rest of my family. Cool. Uh, my grandfather actually played and scouted. Uh, my father played and scouted, and actually my great uncle played professionally as well. Uh, so I've been around the, the game of baseball a long time. I grew up in locker rooms here in the States and in Japan. 
Um, you know, and I think what's kind of great about sports is there's so many great opportunities to interact with different people from around the country and around the world. Uh, but just seeing your own country in a different way was was really cool. Yeah, I bet. I went to high school in Japan, so I had an opportunity. Oh, very cool. Yeah, you yeah. get it. You see a very, and also, I mean, baseball's huge in Japan. I mean, we oh, know that huge. here now. It's, it, yeah. it has been for a long time. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah, that so, was during the strike. Uh, ah. My father went over there and played during the strike here and, and loved it so much he didn't want to leave. So uh, oh, we right. stuck around. So how long were you there? Uh, I was there from like one to four years old off, you know, six months at a time. Um, we had like our lives there during the season and we'd come back here and, you know, kind of mix and match with the family stateside and then get back uh, for the next season. So I uh, kind of had definitely had a dual citizenship little life growing up. Yeah, interesting. I did the same in my teenage years when my dad was a, a Navy doctor and went to Japan. He, he oh, was wow. in private practice for many years and then decided... I'm going to do something new. And that's what he did. So I hey, went back and forth. That's what it's about. Yeah. That's what it's about. Okay. So what happened to, tell, my, tell our listeners, what happened to the baseball career? Because you would think that's like most kids' dream job. Yeah. What would take you out of that? Yeah. And I think the great thing about professional sports is it's, it's a dream in, in two different ways. You know, obviously getting to play on the field, wear the uniform, perform in front of a large crowd. That's great. That's, yeah. you know, hitting the game winner or hitting a walk off you know, at the buzzer, whatever, all those great kind of things we focus on growing up. But what's also great about the sports world is kind of the social dynamic and the networking you get to do. Uh, people just see you in a different way and you, you have access to different things that you just aren't accustomed to getting outside professional sports. And, you know, I kind of was able to see those things growing up with my parents, seeing kind of the, the opportunities and the people that you meet from all these kind of cool industries and you know, one of the groups that we ended up working with was uh, waste industry and seeing how that kind of interacted with sports. So were um, these fans know. or owners or? or yeah, uh, I, I guess a little bit of both. You know, you have boosters in college, but in professional sports, you just have, you know, really great fans who, who buy box tickets, who yeah. have season tickets, who maybe uh, donate money to the team's foundation or you know, maybe help the, the guy who owns the stadium get the team on in the beginning. Um, and that's kind of what my dad was into when he got to Oakland was um, a bunch of the guys who ran the waste industry up there were fans of the team and uh, loved the golf and loved the hunt and do all these other things. So, um, you know, he got to see and be around these people growing up uh, for me was pretty cool. But you had to get out of sports because of an injury, right? Yes. Um, I, uh, I had a pretty bad knee injury that I realized I was playing with uh, for about a season. So once I was uh, released and had the opportunity to kind of get back into it and, um, you know, started finding some things out about myself when I was in rehab, you know, sitting in a bed and unable to move, you mm -hmm. know, trying to help other people because that's just kind of what I always was used to was using the things I had uh, at my disposal to try to bring others together. It's just being a sports guy. It's always what I enjoyed. And, um, you know, good. on been yeah. pretty heartbreaking though, right? And when you realize yeah. your career in that, in that arena is over. Yeah. And I think what made it easier for me was I took some time away, did some other things, got into independent acting, did some, some things in the entertainment space, but I started to work to go back to play. I got wow. back in shape. I was working out. I was playing, uh, you know, intramural type games and was reaching out to teams. And then I got to a point where I was like, look, you know, I think, I've accomplished everything I need to do here. And there's just, there's something else for me. Um, you know, so I, I the door was still open and mm -hmm. I kind of turned away and I, I, oh. I'm back in sports now, uh, just in the, the avenue that I'm working now instead of on the field. So what, what was calling you when you could have gone either way? You could go, I, you met all these interesting people. You saw big business, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Those are the, the big fans at the, uh, in baseball. And you could have gone the entertainment route. You could have gone back to sports. And what pulled you in the direction that you went? Um, like I said, I think I just saw issues uh, growing up during my playing time that once that, that kind of hold of my life of professional baseball ended, um, I just, my eyes were like back up onto the world. You know, what's going on? What's, mm -hmm. What are people struggling with? And, um, you know, you ask a few questions, you meet a certain people at a certain time. and 
you dive into the internet and um, you know kind of go into a little uh, hermit crab stage and just kind of dive into this world of waste and renewable energy and agriculture and marketing and how all these things tie together you know just overall perspective um, you know when I thought about my life being less than trying to fix those things yeah. uh, I, I figured out baseball at that time my life just wasn't ready for me anymore okay but waste you, you mentioned the waste management industry mm -hmm. now i think of that as kind of like the concrete block industry i mean it just seems yeah. like sort of obscure and sort of you know strange what what was it about that that grabbed you well you know like i said from a young age you focus on kind of the the primary things you know when you're you're old enough to realize things are better than maybe what you have you know mm -hmm. so when you roll up to a a golf club or you know the hunt club or something and you see you know oh your dad has a, a nice truck or something but then all the guys who are there outside of that have the top of the top they have five or six houses and multiple cars and all these things you're like wait what what's the difference and then you realize like oh they're in the waste industry or they're in uh, renewable or alternative energy or they they have aquifers and they bottle water and you start seeing things from a different perspective like waste or like vital resources and you see like oh wait those are the people who own the teams those are the people oh, who write okay. the checks for the players right. and so when you, you see that door open uh, at that point they were almost equally as far apart getting back into baseball and getting to the big leagues seemed just as attainable as maybe going down this other space and learning and maybe being something different in the industry that maybe needed it, uh, I, I have just as much of a chance of doing that than I did going back to baseball. It just seemed you. like a, so, a fun yeah, place to go. Becoming a power broker or some, you know, the kings of industry <laughs> or a baseball yeah. player, both are, are pretty heady and pretty hard. But was, yeah. it, was it the money that got you or was it the fact that there was a business and in, in waste? I mean, what, what, what struck you? I think just like in any other, any other situation, you want to feel value. You want to feel that your contribution to whether it's a team or a, an idea is, is valuable. And, yeah. you know, like I said, I was making comparisons to my value on the field, the potential of that, or can I actually make a difference outside of a game? You know, maybe the people that watch the game, maybe I can help a community instead of just the 5,000 fans that were, they were at the game that day. So for me, I just saw, social issues and business issues and i just you know i feel like i can do something here and that that was enough and then when you start asking questions and meeting the right people and you start getting that that positive reaction you're like oh wait i'm on to something and i i you're the entrepreneur that you are that that drive that kind of itch you, you you gotta see it through so what was the first step or what was the action that that got you into business did somebody offer you a job um, you know, I was looking for jobs, you know, obviously when I got done playing baseball, there was no other plan. My entire mm -hmm. life was, here's the avenue of professional baseball. Right. Here's how you're going to get there. This is what you're going to do. Bam. That was yeah. just it. And Family so business. It, exactly. Sure. And so when it ended on, uh, on July 4th, technically it was, mm -hmm. it was, we had a game on the third, we got back after midnight. So it was the fourth I got released, uh, that day and drove the six hours back home. And, um, you know, for that situation after that, it was just like, you know, there's, like I said, there's more. Um, and I, I want to be a part of that. And I think, you know, just there's enough to do. And I think I, I want to work with people. I know what my strengths are. I know what I'm not good at. Uh, I think that's good advice for anybody is that, you know, find your group, find the people that fill your, uh, your blind spots and you could, you could attain a lot. So people were encouraging you to take the step. Did you start your own business then? Did you just yeah. decide, I'm going to just hang out a shingle and I'm going to figure this out? <laughs> yeah. I mean, originally uh, I played around a round of golf uh, when I was watching my grandparents' house. Uh, they were, my grandparents were going to the World Series because the Cardinals at the time were in the World Series. Yeah. This is 2013. Right. And uh, so I, they have a local golf course. I went out and ended up linking up with this guy I'd never met before who was in the solar industry. He did. Uh, solar panel for parking structures and things like that and just you know three hours on the golf course diving into solar energy and all these kind of unique things it opened up my mind to the possibilities and um, you know found some opportunities using kind of cool new age technology where you can incinerate waste and 
it was in, in France and we found a guy the, that spoke English that worked there for his uh, college program. And he ended up being one of my first partners and all these kind of crazy wow. things linked up. Um, you know, pull on the thread on the sweater and, you know, it'll look different. You know, yeah. at first we were very technologically focused. Now it's social marketing kind of engagement focused using technology to, to kind of promote these different things. So, so um, what kinds of things does the business do? What does we go for to do now? What sort of uh, services, activities, what do, what's your day to day customer? Who do you support? Yeah. So right now, our big focus is with minor league baseball. Um, obviously, being a former player in that league, I understand kind of how impactful they are to their communities. And uh, there's 160 teams. They play uh, over 10,000 games a year. There's 43 million fans a year that go to the games. And my, the cool stat is that 81% of the U.S. population lives within driving distance of a minor league team. So wow. uh, we see it as a great place to kind of instill some – some knowledge, create a narrative, and then people can then take it home with them uh, and create the narrative kind of personally within their own, the confines of their own home, uh, but they the, pick it up at the game. What's the kind of one liner then? And what is that narrative that, what do you want people to walk away with understanding or knowing? Well, our, our kind of one liner for We Go For Two is our product is our impact. So ah. us making an actual measurable difference is the most important part you know obviously making money is equally as important uh, but we have to be able to make measurable impact so right now we're a program kind of development group so we develop kind of like a program similar to like a personal trainer would develop your workout regimen right uh, so we give people an opportunity to take advantage of sustainability Mm -hmm. while not getting them bogged down by the struggle of just getting acquainted and what sustainability even means and all the different compartments that make up sustainability. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a structure that we're kind of working within that right now. Okay. I want, I want to, I want to hang out with one phrase that you, I love our product is our impact. Mm -hmm. That's a great line. And I've never heard that. I always, I always tell my coaching clients, when they hit on something, it's like, oh, my cliche meter is going way over to the heard that a million times side. Yeah. But I haven't heard that a lot. And I think that probably applies, I mean, to people who do what I do, professional speakers, people yep. that are out there, you think, gee, are my results sort of uh, fuzzy or non-metrics based or abstract? But no, it's it's the impact that you make. So that's yeah. what you measure. Yep. And and. Okay, so you're training, you're developing programs, like you'd go into a company and say, mm -hmm. hey, here's what you guys can do to, to turn the needle. Yeah, pretty much, you know, the, the initial stages are like getting, a, getting ready to get a suit fitted. So everyone kind of has an initial onboarding process where, okay, you know, what are your, what are your low hanging fruit? What are your trouble areas? You know, what are the things you want to know more about? You know, I can't help you save water unless we know how much water you're using to begin with okay. and what kind of consistent benchmarks do we see so we can work from there. You know, what's the problem with sustainability right now? Most organizations kind of walk in blindly or falling victim to what I call like the sex appeal of new technology. Cause it sounds good. Sustainability. Yeah. When right. it's not always the best fit. And that's what we don't want is we don't want people to take a chance or take mm -hmm. that sustainability step get burned and then be hesitant to, to jump back in again. Because there's a downside to them, right? You're going to use less, less electricity or less water or less something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, most of us don't like that. No. So, and what ends up happening, especially with sports teams, is they're so focused on, you know, the community side first. Like, hey, let's get all of our fans to recycle. and We're going to do a waste audit. So we're going to know we're going to have all of our stuff separated. All of our recyclables are going to be separated and ready to go. And we're going to take all the food waste and mm -hmm. uh, create a composting program. where We're going to hire interns and do all this stuff. And then you go, great. You did all that. You did a whole season of top-notch stuff. Did you guys save money? No. Did you guys measure, you know, reductions, CO2 reductions, footprint, any of that? Uh, no. no. We just, we, we composted that, but we don't really know what that looks like because maybe the composting facility was 100 miles away. So maybe actually your footprint was actually increased More, by. Yeah. <laughs> so it that's felt the idea. good. It sounded good, exactly. but it did. Yeah, that's interesting. I know there's such a conflict now with 
um, people flying and flying more. And there's so mm -hmm. much available. And even people, you know, there was a lot about people flying to a climate summit. It's mm -hmm. like, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> wait, shouldn't this be virtual? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's, it's yeah. really hard to wrap your head on, around. But I would imagine a lot of companies don't even know what their, what their no sort clue. of flu footprint is or what their climate yeah. is. Yeah, no, definitely. And then, um, so what, what are people at home? What can I do? I'm, I'm pretty self-aware, I think. I recycle and I, yeah, but I'm probably like everybody else. I don't, I don't know if I'm doing it right or if things mm -hmm. are going to the places they're supposed to go or there are things I'm overlooking that could be so simple. And I yeah. do think that it, it's probably, global is probably a lot harder than household, neighborhood, community. Mm -hmm. Where do you start as an individual? Well, the, I think you touched on it there at the end is, you know, everyone looks at sustainability as this global initiative. Yeah. And we really, we have to focus locally first because people don't realize their local impact, what they're doing locally actually does have a global impact. Uh, like, like, you know, for example, you know, you said you recycle at home. Do you actually know that? That's kind of the question people have to start asking is, is what I'm doing actually what I think I'm doing? So when you say you're recycling, for the most part, most likely you're just sorting because oh, yeah. you're, you're right. it's now dependent on the waste hauler you're paying to move your trash. They have to recycle. They have to follow through on that kind of chain or the last 10 or 15 years, they've gone to facilities and put all the plastics into big squares and then they send them overseas where they can either refine it and reduce it or they manipulate it and make it back into plastic toys or other mm -hmm. things like that where, um, you know, now the situations have changed. So, you know, recycling is not really done at home. Uh, it's done by the, the next people that handle the waste after that. And you don't know. And that's you know, the problem. You're so right. I think I'm recycling, but I'm not. I am sorting. Mm -hmm. I am sorting trash versus, you know, the, the things I think will be recycled versus just food waste, yep. which I should be composting. And I know in some cities, I go visit my stepson in San Francisco and they've got the composting and the, the, it's very yep. much sorted. Oh yeah. Um, but other cities, and then some cities, there's nothing there. You don't yep. even have a recycle bin or, so we're all over the map. So yeah. what, do you, what, is, what are some of the things you tell people you could do this to, to make a difference in your own home? Yeah, I mean, like I said, the, the simple ones are, you know, straws, plastic bags, plastic water bottles, um, you know, plastic reusable uh, containers for, you know, to take away or, you know, there's all these different things. And, you know, so what I always try to help people focus on is just focus on one thing, one stream first, um, because if you just focus on one thing first, you can guarantee that reduction. You know, for me, the simple one was water bottles. I'm an ex-athlete, I drink a lot of water. You know, you go through eight to 10 water bottles in a day. Um, so for me, switching to single use uh, was a big difference. Now, my fiance, on the other hand, plastic straws are her, her thing that she needs to focus on. So we made use of the straws we already had. You know, we try to clean them and reuse them, but you know, who wants to do all that? Yeah. Uh, and then once those ran out, she tried the paper ones. They were too flimsy and didn't yeah. like all that. So she ended up uh, liking some some reusable plastic ones that they yeah. have, or you know, some metal. Or there are some ones yeah. that are like bamboo and stuff. So I've seen the you know, bamboo, for her, yeah. Yeah. that was her. That was her one thing. You know, some people might uh, grocery bags might be theirs, or you know, just like even food wrappers. You know, like how many people pack lunches uh, for work? You know, how many people go through you know, eight, 10, 12, 15 little Ziploc bags a week. Yeah. Um, you know, those are little things that when you start looking at it one item at a time, you can make a bigger difference. Yeah. Wow. So what are big, what, what are the lessons that you can share? What do you think the biggest thing that people trying to build a business or, or even just building a career Mm -hmm. Based on the experiences you've had, you've gone through a lot of change, you've taken some risks, you've, you've jumped into unexpected areas. What, do you th what are some of the things you learned on the, along the way that, that other people could benefit from? You know, I think obviously just like anything else, you got to know yourself. You have to know what makes you tick, what you enjoy. You know, I like working with teams and interacting with people and hearing their specialties and putting that blend together. Some people, that's the opposite of what they like. Some people 
work best in isolation or some people work best, you know, outside with music on or, you know, buy some, uh, you know, maybe in their bathroom, you know, whatever, you know, everyone kind of has their own, their own spice. So, you know, first kind of just get to know yourself a little bit. Um, you know, for me, I knew that just naturally I like to kind of offer my insight, offer my advice or, you know, offer a hand, um, you know, or just try to give me people a different perspective of something they look at the same angle every day. Um, you know, don't be scared of that. Did, the, did that force time, I'm wondering if that time when you were in, in rehab, um, it, it kind of opened, yeah, I mean, it was, you were forced into that situation, but was yeah. the self-reflection and sort of the stepping out of your day-to-day, -day, was that helpful? Yeah, and I, you spoke to the injury, and, and actually there was a really important moment within that injury period where, um, you know, coming from professional sports, I had the luxury of great doctors. You know, and I realized sitting in my room for three weeks uh, while my knee got to a point where I could actually start moving around, I realized how lucky I was not only to be in a comfortable space and be healing, but to have top notch doctors and rehabilitation services. And so on in bed while I was getting better, I, I started I wanted to start an online platform, a website where people could find doctors and medical professionals based on their their actual skill and abilities, not their uh, chances of marketing online, because there's a big difference. Um, mm -hmm. You know, never took the website out of beta stages. It was more just kind of that creation of that and working with people and setting up the site and being like, wait a second, I don't know if I enjoy this particular thing, but I enjoy working with people from dis different disciplines and I enjoy creating opportunity for people to help themselves. So I just continued mm -hmm. to run with that. And like I said, you know, pull the string. Um, what is it, the two or three degrees of separation? You just yeah. don't know who somebody knows, where somebody is going to turn you towards, um, that's going to totally change things. Um, and you just have to be comfortable with that and just know yourself kind of things are going to be okay. Yeah. And just to add to that, there's a, and Malcolm Gladwell's, I forget which book it was in, maybe Blink. He talks about the law of weak ties. It's hard mm -hmm. to say. Weak ties. The people that are around you tend to know who and what you know, because that's kind of your inner circle. But once you start to reach out beyond that, where your connections are not quite so strong, mm -hmm. you branch out into all sorts of unexpected things. Yep. That, that sounds like what you did through the people that you met through baseball. You started going down those paths and talking to people. And yep. something as simple as you know a, a golf game I'm sure you were just relentlessly picking that guy's brain. Yeah. And, you know, and sometimes too, you have to understand that, like I said, I mentioned it earlier, perspective is everything. Um, and, you know, we've all seen those kind of little optical illusion things where it looks like a chair, but then if you step a few feet to the side, it's actually a long yeah. kind of, so, you know, I saw situations where, you know, like waste or resources, you look at it different and all of a sudden you give people an opportunity to look at something they think they know from a different angle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always joke, it's like, you know, a cup is for drinking, but if you turn it upside down, you could, you know, put some on top of it. Now it has a totally different purpose. So, right. um, you know, don't be scared to, to pull the string and see where it goes. And turn things upside down. I like that. So <laughs> Shane, where can we find more about you? Is it we go for two numeral TWO? Yeah, so it's we go for two, like you said, usually the two is kind of sub superscripted, like the degrees is. Yeah, um, yeah obviously we go for two.com is coming online shortly. Uh, you can find us uh, at guest.eco, so it's G E S S dot E C O. Um, obviously, social media at Shane Keo is pretty easy as well. I, I try to keep uh, followers up to date on what we're doing as well. Great. And I have one last question for you. And this is, this is my radical thought question. If you could make some change, you're already doing it actually, but some change in the world through just one radical idea, what would you like to see happen? Uh, I, the simple word is just collaboration. Uh, I, I just, in the simplest of things, I just see that people working together, regardless of their specialities or beliefs or whatever, people moving in the same direction uh, is a good thing. So, you know, don't be scared to, to mingle with uh, people from different disciplines or different backgrounds. You'd be so surprised how uh, helpful they'll be in your life moving forward. Yeah. And, and clearly you've touched a lot of lives and you've given a lot of 
of help and support to others. And it, it really is that, that I think that's your gift is collaboration. You, you grew up with teamwork. You're still doing it today in a completely different, a different stadium, let's say. Yeah. A yeah, different I ballpark. So. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And no problem, Libby. You can all pretty soon, you'll be able to find we go for two.com and you can find Shane Keo online as well. Thanks everybody. And have a great day. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Radical CEO. We invite you to view the episode blog post at our website, libbygill.com forward slash podcast to get links and access additional resources. Join us again next time for another episode of the Radical CEO. Radical CEO.